When staging head and neck cancer, one of the most important roles for the radiologist is to establish the extent of the primary tumor. While this is true everywhere in the head and neck, in the larynx, the complex anatomy can make it more challenging. The purpose of this lecture is to talk about laryngeal anatomy in the context of staging a primary cancer of the larynx. These are the sites of spread that we're about to discuss, the epiglottis and its petiole, the area epiglottic folds that connect the epiglottis to the rest of the supraglottis, the false and true cords, including the commissure, the paraglottic and preepiglottic fat pads, the cartilages, where we want to distinguish not just between the three major cartilages, thyroid, cricoid, and the retinoid cartilages, but also between the inner and outer tables of the thyroid cartilage, because it makes a difference in staging. And secondarily, the hypopharynx. Talk about uh, primaries in the hypopharynx and how they can secondarily affect the larynx, or vice versa, primaries in the larynx secondarily affecting the hypopharynx. The normal epiglottis sticks up from the larynx, paralleling the base of the tongue, Here's the base of the tongue, here's the epiglottis, into the oropharynx. It marks the dividing line between the oropharynx, uh, specifically the vollecula here, and the larynx, specifically the laryngeal vestibule, and also the hypopharynx back here. Here's the epiglottis as seen in the axial plane. Notice how thin the normal epiglottis is. It's like a pencil line drawn onto an axial image. There are a couple of connections between the epiglottis and the surrounding mucosal surfaces. Now, the epiglottis is anchored, of course, in the larynx, the supraglottis, inside the larynx, and we'll talk about that in a second. But even as it sticks up into the oropharynx, there are also some additional anchors. Here in the midline, is the hyoepiglottic ligament. It connects the hyoid bone to the epiglottis, and it is covered by a fold of mucosa called the median glossoepiglottic fold. Now, if there's a median glossoepiglottic fold, there must be lateral glossoepiglottic folds, and indeed, here they are. The epiglottis is also anchored laterally by these lateral glossoepiglottic folds. Now, there's no underlying ligament here, just the mucosal fold itself on the, uh, on the lateral side. This is important because tumors can affect the epiglottis and extend out to the pharyngeal wall by traveling through the glossoepiglottic folds. Here's an example of a tumor that arose perhaps even in the glossoepiglottic fold and, and then extends both to the epiglottis, you can see by how thickened it is compared to its counterpart on the other side, and extends out to the pharyngeal wall. Okay, pop quiz. What airspace is this with the red stars on it? Well, we are anterior to the epiglottis. This is the anterior surface of the epiglottis, so that makes this the base of tongue. That's the hyoepiglottic ligament, excuse me, the hyoepiglottic ligament. And these then demarcate the two sides of the vollecula. That's the vollecula. All right, then what are these? Well, out on either side of the epiglottis is where we send the food. The epiglottis divides the food into the two sides and sends it down to either side to go into the hypopharynx. So this is the portion of the hypopharynx that's out laterally. We call that the piriform sinuses, right? Now, another thing that's important about the epiglottis is that it has two surfaces. It has a laryngeal surface that points towards the laryngeal ventricle, which is this airspace here, and it has a vollecular surface that points up out towards the vollecula. Sometimes tumors will have mucosal spread along one side or the other. In general, uh, tongue-based tumors tend to run along the vollecular side of the epiglottis, and laryngeal tumors tend to run, run along the laryngeal side, as you might expect. Uh, many cancers go through and through and involve both surfaces, uh, but it's useful if you can distinguish in those cases where, there, uh, where it's possible to distinguish the surface. All right, well, if this is the normal size of the epiglottis, just a thin object sticking up, here's what the epiglottis looks like when it becomes thickened and affected by cancer. This is a cancer exclusively within the epiglottis, no spread down to the rest of the larynx, just in the epiglottis, and you can get a tumor arising exclusively there that goes nowhere else. 
Here's what this looks like in the axial plane. Again, the epiglottis is supposed to be this thin line with some anchors, but a thin line sitting in the oropharynx. Look how thick it is when it is infiltrated by this tumor, right? All of that is epiglottis. It's got the same configuration as the normal epiglottis, but way too thick and way too enhancing. That's tumor. Uh, here's an example of tumor spread along the molecular and laryngeal surfaces. Here you can see superficial tumor spread uh, completely filling this molecula along all the surfaces of the molecular, but specifically along the molecular surface of the epiglottis there. And here is a tumor arising on the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis. That's the epiglottis. There's the molecula. This is the laryngeal vestibule. And there is the cancer running along the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis. Now, the bottom of the epiglottis, where it attaches to the rest of the, of the larynx, has a special name. It is the petiole of the epiglottis. This is also sometimes called the base of the epiglottis, and this is where the epiglottis attaches to the rest of the superglottis. Uh, you can see that the epiglottis will sometimes calcify, as most cartilages will. Uh, and here is the bottom, and that is the petiole of the epiglottis. And you can see that this rather extensive tumor has uh, extended up to include the petiole of the epiglottis right here, right where it attaches in. While we're on this topic, Let's shift over to the pre-epiglottic fat. Uh, one of the reasons that the petiole of the epiglottis is so important is its proximity to this pre-epiglottic fat. So this fat pad that lives just anterior to the petiole of the epiglottis, that is the pre-epiglottic fat. And it is a critical area for us to identify when it is invaded by tumor as it is in this case. Here's another example of the preepiglottic fat involved by the uh, involved by tumor. This is the base of the epiglottis here, the petiole, and there's infiltration of tumor into the preepiglottic fat. You can see the same thing in the sagittal plane as this tumor extends anterior to the base of the epiglottis towards the hyoid bone and takes out that fat pad that should be sitting right there. The aryepiglottic folds drape over the sides of the epiglottis and extend down towards the arytenoid cartilages. They separate the larynx here from the piriform sinus of the hypopharynx here and here. These are the aryepiglottic folds. So here's our epiglottis and this tissue extending down on either side of the epiglottis is the aryepiglottic fold and it's headed towards these here, the arytenoid cartilages, right? Laryngeal surface, the aryepiglottic fold, pharyngeal surface of the aryepiglottic fold, specifically the piriform sinuses of the hypopharynx. Here's a tumor uh, infiltrating into the aryepiglottic fold. You can see how thick the aryepiglottic fold is on this side compared to its counterpart on this side. This is also abnormally enhancing and this is infiltrated by tumor. You can see that the piriform sinus visible on this side lateral to the aryepiglottic fold has become compressed on the affected side by the mass effect from the tumor. Let's continue now more inferiorly to talk about the true and false vocal cords. This is a coronal MRI and it's showing a cross section right through the center of the larynx. And you can see that there are two different things sticking in from either side to interrupt the center of the larynx. On the bottom are the true vocal cords and on the top are the false vocal cords. You can see that the true vocal cords are composed predominantly of muscle, just like the other muscular tissue surrounding the larynx, whereas the false vocal cords are composed of fat. That's a very important distinction. By the way, this, uh, th this air filled pocket that lies between the true and false vocal cords. That's the laryngeal ventricle. It is often collapsed into potential space, but you can see here that it is filled with air as it is sometimes. So taking these principles to an axial CT, the true vocal cords are distinguishable because they are composed of muscle. It's the same color as the strap muscles overlying the larynx. Here are the true vocal cords coming from the anterior uh, of the larynx back to attach on the arytenoids, right? That the cords have in common, the true and false cords have in common. They both come from the anterior larynx back to the arytenoid cartilages, but the true cords are composed of muscle. 
Here are the false chords, also coming from the anterior larynx back diagonally towards the arytenoid cartilages here and here, but this time filled with fat. False chords full of fat, true chords full of muscle. They can look very similar on axial images, just one or two cuts separating them. So how do we identify a tumor in the true chords? Well, there are two things you're looking for. You're looking for focal enhancement, which we can see right here, that's abnormal enhancement, and you're looking for a disruption in the contour of the mucosa. Notice how bulged out the mucosa is here overlying that cancer. That's a really important clue, a change in contour of the mucosa, as well as enhancement. Here's another example where there is some linear enhancement around a central non-enhancing area, maybe entrapped mucus or maybe tumor necrosis, um, but there is just heterogeneous enhancement here, particularly at the periphery. And you really need to notice the change in the contour of the mucosa here to identify that lesion. Here's another example that shows the focal enhancement and the contour changes, right? Should be a pretty smooth oval of, of the glottis right here. And there that oval is interrupted um, by this enhancing focal mass that is pushing into the air column. Now, one more example here of irregularity in the wall. Here I would say it's very hard to distinguish a focal area of enhancement. And so we're really going to rely on that contour abnormality to let us know that there is a tumor on the true cords. The anterior commissure of the true vocal cords is the point where the two true vocal cords come together and meet anteriorly. The mucosa here should be pencil line thin, almost no visible soft tissue between the thyroid cartilage and the air column. Or it should come to a point as it does here in this normal example. Here's an example where you can see how thick the abnormal soft tissue is at the, con at the commissure. Now, of course, there's another clue here because as we talked about before, there's focal enhancement and a distortion in the contour of, of the mucosa. So we see that this tumor, but importantly, this tumor comes across midline along the anterior commissure. It's important to note involvement of the anterior commissure. And it's also an important clue that a tumor that arose on one true vocal cord may have spread across the front to the other true vocal cord. Here's another uh, example, maybe a little more difficult. Uh, where's the tumor? We're not seeing a good a contour abnormality to clue us in. So it's hard to define where the edges of this tumor are, but look how thick that anterior commissure is. There should just be coming to a pencil point here. Um, so that's the clue that you're dealing with tumor on the anterior aspect of both of these true vocal cords. Uh, as an aside, some people refer to the region uh, between the arytenoid cartilages as the posterior commissure, but that's sort of a colloquial use of the term. Okay, the false cords. You can see here the arytenoid cartilages. So this fat containing structure that's coming forward from the arytenoid cartilage, that's the false cord. That's how we know where we are in the larynx on this axial image, we're at the level of the false cords. And here is a centrally non-enhancing, rim-enhancing mass filling the left false vocal cord. That's the primary tumor. Here's another example as seen in the coronal plane, and you can see a large tumor here filling the false cords. There are the muscular true cords further down, fat containing false cords, muscular true cords. You can even just make out the laryngeal ventricle with some enhancing mucosa on either side of the ventricle, separating the tumor in the false cords from the true cords below. This time, both of the false vocal cords are involved. So you can't look to the other cord to know what level you're at, but you can see some fat here in the background that will help us to localize our level. Um, here we're seeing uh, symmetric bilateral involvement of both of the false vocal cords. Of the really important radiologic concepts with regard to the false 
vocal cords is submucosal spread of disease. Sometimes a tumor that arises in the true vocal cords will have submucosal spread up to the false vocal cords out laterally around the laryngeal ventricle. It can be very difficult to identify this endoscopically because there's no disruption to the mucosa in the false cords per se. So it's super important for us to identify this radiologically. Here's a patient with a bulky tumor at the level of the true vocal cords. And here it is spreading superiorly around the laryngeal ventricle. Now we're at the level of the false cords as indicated by the fat. It's up and around. So you can see the the change in contour, but sometimes this is not evident uh, endoscopically, and it's really up to the radiologist to find this additional tumor spread to the supraglottis. Here's the same concept on a coronal image. You can see here are, here's the true vocal cord, there's the false vocal cord, as promised, this one's full of muscle and this one's full of fat. Here is the enhancing tumor in the true vocal cord and you can see it spreading up and around to replace the fat and cause fullness in the false vocal cord above. It's coming around the laryngeal ventricle. You can still make out that ventricle right there and the tumor coming up and around. This concludes part one of the lecture on laryngeal subsites for staging squamous cell carcinoma.